Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and this is a podcast about innovation and equity in global health. Now, this is one of our podcasts brought to you in partnership with the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. The Alliance is a network of academic institutions, companies, NGOs, and community-based organizations, all based in the Bay Area and all committed to improving the health of people around the world. You can find out more about the Alliance by checking out its website at www.bayareaglobalhealth.org. Well, in this episode, we are looking at the life and career of one of the pioneers of infectious disease, from HIV to COVID, and we follow her journey from local roots to global reach. She became a doctor at the start of the AIDS epidemic, and she went on to be the director of the CDC after 9-11 and then SARS and Hurricane Katrina before assuming a leadership role as Chief Patient Officer at Merck. We speak with her as she's about to embark on a new adventure as CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Julie Gerberding, welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, you're someone I've wanted to have on as a guest for for quite a while, Julie. You you really are a, a pioneer part of the generation of AIDS leaders that came out of UCSF. Um, You have straddled the public and the private sector and now uh, indeed the foundation sector, which we'll we'll come on to. But but really where I'd love to start is here in the 21st century and uh, something that you and I are both committed to, uh, using the power of social and digital outreach to uh, reach people and to educate around um, medical information. We're both partners of the Alliance for Advancing Health Online. Um, Here at A Shot in the Arm, we're we're producing a podcast called Vax Up, looking at ways in which we can utilize um, messaging through social media. Um, And it's a collaboration we both have with the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. And I just wondered, what are your hopes for the Alliance? How do you think social and digital outreach can help us reach the patient community more effectively? You know, one of the challenges that we're all facing is that we are drowning in information, misinformation, and disinformation, and it's very difficult to tell the difference. So I think one of my hopes for the Alliance is by coming together credible people who learn to understand the science behind effective social communication, but also the receptors of social media and information, and maybe reshape or reformulate not only the channel of how information is prosecuted, but also how it can be shaped in ways that bring more meaning and more understanding to the participants in the network. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of jargon. What I'm really saying is that it is here. It's going to be here. It's kind of up to us to come together and figure out how can we create lemonade out of these lemons and really use this incredibly powerful information resource to help people gain uh, gain insights and make better decisions. Yeah, I I think you're right. I mean, I you know I've been a infectious disease advocate for twenty five years or so. I would never have guessed that I would be engaged with technology so much. Um, and for me, the the whole idea of the podcast uh, came about when I was um, doing laundry and listening to my favorite <laughs> shows and thinking, why is there nothing around around global health? And and I guess um, y- you know. We've got. We're constantly having new tools that we that we use to educate and inform. And I, I don't know. As you sort of look at the thirty eight thousand foot level, um, are there other um, other tools that you think are, are, are important? Maybe new things or things that, in fact, we we shouldn't lose sight of, like direct interaction between patients and healthcare workers. You know the important thing we've all been missing for two years is that ability to really look people in the eye, not (laughs) through the kind of communication you and I are enjoying right now, but to really um, look people in the eye and experience the joy of human to human touch. That is such a relevant part of communication. It brings me back to the early days of HIV when a lot of us were afraid 
we were afraid to touch our patients in, in, in some kind of interior way. And yet that touch is the thing that bridges the gap between the patient and the healer. And it's just so important to bring that element of human relationships back into conversation. Because if you can touch someone, kind of by definition, you can trust that person. And trust is hard to decipher in electronic media. Yeah, the 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 whole emotional intelligence side of the interaction between the healthcare worker, uh, well, just human human interaction. Period. It's been a real challenge on Zoom, hasn't it? It really has, and you know, as as much fun as we can find in Zoom, and certainly better than talking on the telephone for two years. Um, it does create a, an impersonal. Um, a means of, of communicating. I had the pleasure of um, attending one of the doctors' meetings inside the company where doctors from across the United States who hadn't been together in a really long time finally were able to gather for an important medical meeting. And the content of the meeting became very unimportant. What was important was literally hugging people that yeah. haven't been able to see each other in person for such a long period of time. It was just joyful to get back into the really common denominator of human experience. And I'm sure everyone is is hopefully beginning to appreciate how important and for a long time missing that has been. Oh, yeah, totally. And, you know, sort of fingers crossed that we can, we, we, we've now sort of crossed that yeah. Rubicon. And so, can I take you back to your to your early life, um, and 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 this is a very different kind of pioneering. You, you were born in Esteline in South Dakota, and I I, I looked at the census numbers from 2010, and <laughs> it's a town of 768 people. So so what was that like? Can you talk about your your early years growing up in South Dakota? Well, well, first, I, I will confess that I was actually born in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic, but I did grow up in Esteline, South Dakota. Um, you know, it, what I will say right now will sound Pollyannish, but it was a privilege to grow up in a small community where everyone was very interconnected, but also we did have that profound sense of dependency on each other. I always use the anecdote that we had blizzards and ice storms and tornadoes and floods, many kind of natural disasters. We never called FEMA for help. We always knew that we could help each other. And I remember my dad uh, going to the church, filling up sandbags, helping an elderly woman out of her house in a boat, and so on and so forth. We just did what had to be done. But you develop that interdependence on the community, and I, I think it makes you more of a collaborator. And kind of by definition, you have to you have to learn to read between the lines and and understand what makes the other person tick because. You know, you're going to be living with that person and knowing them very well for a long period of time in, in such a small community. When did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? And that's such an easy question for me. It was Christmas, my fourth year of life. Someone gave me a doctor kit and it just happened in my head. I think also I have an overactive empathy gene and was the one in the family constantly rec uh, sort of rescuing the injured bird or rabbit or whatever it was and trying to nurse them back to health. Unfortunately, my parents indulged me in that <laughs> uh, fantasy, but it, it was very serious and, and basically never wavered from that dream from that moment forward. Gosh, that I, wonderful. Um, and, and you, you obtained your so first of all you got your BA in biology, um, and then your um, you became an MD um, at Case Western in Cleveland. Now, how much of a uh, how much of a change was that from Esteline? You know, moving from a, a small town to a, to essentially a big city. Well, you know, um, from where I grew up, Cleveland was the East, <laughs> and so I really felt like I was going back east to college. But I really wanted to go to college there. It was my dream school because I wanted to go to medical school there. Case was renowned at that point in time for having a very unusual curriculum. 
borrowed from the Canadians, but a curriculum that was all about integrating the study of medicine. So you didn't study pharmacy and anatomy and so forth. You studied the cardiovascular system or the neurologic system. And that's really been a theme of my whole life, that sort of horizontal integration, a consilience of disciplines. And it just intuitively appealed to me. So I really wanted to go to medical school there for that reason. And it seemed like the best way to be able to do that would be to go to undergrad there. So I'm a very loyal double alumni from a Case Western Reserve. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to what you've said, because I think... Um, a lot of your career has been around joining the dots and creating a sort of a multidisciplinary um, approach to to medicine, to healthcare, to to policy. So I think that is so interesting. Um, and 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 then afterwards, you go to UCSF, and you are one of that cadre of people like Paul Volberding, like Eric Goosby, who who really cut your teeth at the beginning mm. of the AIDS epidemic. And, and, and Julie, there's a, there's a question I'm, I'm really keen to ask you. So much of our medicine in the 60s and 70s particularly was, was almost triumphalistic. We were getting to the point where we thought we were going to be curing all diseases. And then suddenly HIV hits, and we discover that the biomedical approach, certainly then in the early to mid 80s, and indeed up until the mid 90s, really didn't help us or didn't help us enough. And I wonder what that was like for you, realizing that the kind of tools that you had available to you in your, your medical kit, your medical bag, perhaps hadn't prepared you for that moment. What was it like? You know, it. It is a time that I look back on with deep reverence, I would say. Um, and the interns in my cohort did arrive in San Francisco with the very beginning of what was recognized eventually as the HIV epidemic. Uh, we were uh, mystified at first. I don't think initially we recognized this was an infectious disease. In fact, I know we didn't. We were confused. Maybe it was a toxic reaction. Maybe it was a drug. Um, we really didn't know what was going on. But when it became obvious that this was an infectious disease, of course, we were also frightened because there was so little known at that time. But to see the hospital, San Francisco General, just overnight fill up with people my age mm-hmm. who were previously some of the most robust and energized people in the city succumb to first a, a terrible wasting illness and then often the really dreaded. Uh, infectious disease complications, the super infections or the reactivation infections from the profound immunodeficiency, and to feel helpless. Um, but you know, I think one of the important dimensions of anyone who's in a situation like that, and, and it happens at scale during things like pandemics, and AIDS was certainly a pandemic, but it also happens one on one when you're at the bedside and you've run out of mm-hmm. options for the patient. It's that sense of your responsibility is to really sort of convert helplessness into hope. And how do you do that for yourself or for your patient is part of the art of medicine. It's not a part of medicine that is necessarily formally taught. Our patients were really very good teachers. And I think, as you probably know from your community work in San Francisco, part of um, that experience was really catalyzed by the incredible activism in the community where our patients knew more about what they needed than we did. And much of what they needed wasn't medical. It was social support. It was kindness. It was, you know, caring and concern, not necessarily curing. And, you know, that in a sense, that's a privilege to have learned medicine during a period of time where the art of medicine was far more dominant in our minds than the science of medicine, because we just didn't have the tools we needed. Yeah. You, so there are two parts of your time in San Francisco that, that I think really stand out. One, and it really resonates now, um, is around the attention that you gave to protections to healthcare workers. Mm-hmm. And um, you, 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 you really led work in trying to minimize the risks that um, 
you know, and 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 not only minimizing the risks, but 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 creating a um, a safe and a um, understandable environment where people knew that those risks were limited, but they were there. And and it resonates because, of course, here we are now, um, hopefully coming out of the, um, the 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 current wave of of COVID, and and I'm thinking of those nurses from Wuhan right at the start of the pandemic mm. when they had those the masks sort of etched onto their faces and the the look of uh, both desperation but also determination. Um, and and I, I wondered what what drove you to really think about how to how to incorporate healthcare professionals in the um, in the prevention and treatment paradigm. You know, it's a complicated answer, so I'll try to summarize it with just a couple of points. One piece of it is that we were scared. You know, when I started medical school training and then the beginning of my internship. I loved working in the emergency room, and part of the spirit of being a doctor was to get bloody. Mm. You know, it made us feel like we were doing something dramatic and important, and I guess channeling the television at the time, the, the emergency room stories, et cetera. And then when we realized this was a bloodborne infection, our vulnerability was hard to overlook. And when you think about young people who are learning medicine and then they're watching young people who are dying of this disease and the boundary between them and us gets narrow and narrow and narrow, um, you, you realize that you have to think differently about how we create a, a, a concept of safety um, and how we can bring science to bear on that. I also had the unfortunate experience of uh, during a resuscitation of a patient who was in the dialysis unit getting completely covered with blood because a line broke. And then I got hepatitis B infection from the blood exposure. Mm -hmm. That really did happen at the same time that we were recognizing that HIV was a bloodborne disease. So I had my personal terror um, in being afraid. I unfortunately did not get clinical hepatitis and was not a, a chronic carrier, but nevertheless, the experience was really a wake-up call. So that line between doctor and patient was very narrow. I think that has happened to a lot of people in the era of AIDS where um, when the dentist in Florida had a practice of patients who developed HIV infection, everybody goes to the dentist. Um, when heterosexual HIV became obvious, you know, a lot of people who falsely assumed they were not at risk discovered that they really were at risk. So that awareness of the boundary condition catalyzed me to say, well, I, I can't go in a lab and find the, find the virus or find the cure, but this is one thing I think I can help with and I can you know, try to apply what I know. And, and that led me to get my MPH because I didn't really know anything about epidemiology. And I thought it might be useful to have a little science under my belt when I'm pursuing the kind of studies that we did then. But I think one of the other um, important learnings for me as a professional was risk-taking in science. My colleague, Dr. David Henderson, who uh, was the deputy of the clinical center at the NIH, David and I started the first national post-exposure treatment protocol for occupationally exposed healthcare workers. And the very part, first part of that protocol was AZT treatment. Mm -hmm. And we were using pretty high doses for six weeks and had absolutely no data that this would be helpful or not. So we took a tremendous risk um, to use a fairly unknown drug in otherwise healthy people and of course, it was a protocol, and we went through all of those machinations. But the point is, um, you really taught me the sense of responsibility that a clinical investigator has to maintain. It taught me um, that you know, when when you're curious and something is really important, you have to take risks, calculated, thoughtful risks, but nevertheless, risks. 
But it also probably most importantly taught me to communicate better <laughs> because when I first started out, we, we initiated a national needle stick hotline so that healthcare workers all over the country could call and ask for advice on what to do. And I initially handed those calls as a scientist. And I said, yeah. well, thank goodness your risk is only 0.3%. But I would like you to take these medicines around the clock for the next six weeks, remove the donor card from your driver's license, don't have sex, don't get pregnant, don't donate blood, but don't worry because everything is going to be okay. And, you know, very quickly learn that when people are frightened, that is not helpful information. <laughs> when people are frightened, what you need to be able to say in the moment, I'm so sorry this happened. Most people in your situation are really scared. and. I'm sure, you know, we can understand why, but here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to go down to the pharmacy and I want you to get one tablet of ACT and just take that. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to sit down and figure out, you know, what really is the risk here and how do we move forward and, you know, f find a way for you to have a better appreciation of where you're at in this process. And don't worry, you can call me anytime. I'll be there for you. Completely different format of communication and kind of by doing it wrong, I, I learned how to get better at it. But that sense of risk communication being very little about facts and charts yeah. and figures and a lot more about caring and sharing and just the reassurance that we don't have all the answers, but we're going to get through this together. And sometimes when I've been watching the COVID communication, I just long for someone to say, I'm so sorry we're in this situation. This is yeah. hard for everyone. I wish I could do more. I wish I knew more. But here's where we are. And this is what we think is the best thing right now. And when we know more, we'll probably have to update our information and recommendations. But we'll get through this. There's, you know, there's, it's just night and day. It is night and day. And, you know, both embracing the idea of risk and and needing to take calculated risk but also that blurring of the line between doctor and patient mm -hmm. julia just ah oh. and 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 i think the implications for where we are today and i do want to come back to those um i i think is just so important we just don't hear enough of that but another thing that you did when you were in san francisco which really plays to to my heart, is the relationship between HIV and urban po uh, poverty. And you, you really led some of the outreach to the marginalized communities, the homeless, the mentally ill in San Francisco. Um, I, I've just been um, elected chair of the San Francisco Community Health Center, which is based in the Tenderloin yeah. and is all about um, street outreach. And, and uh, I, I am certain that you would see um, deep down in its DNA some of the lessons that, that you helped identify and the, um, you know, the approaches that you burgeoned back then. And, and, and I guess, you know, same question uh, as with the healthcare worker protections, what drew you to the relationship between HIV and urban po poverty? You know, I, I'm sure this has to do with, um, I'm sure it has to do with San Francisco General Hospital and just recognizing that it was the hospital that was there for the people. But the people, obviously, is an extraordinarily diverse set of people. And many of them were there because they had no other choice of where they could receive care. And it was frustrating sometimes to be the young physician and have the patient come in one week and get tuned up, and then two weeks later, the patient is back, until you start realizing that what we did in the hospital was such a small part of what could be done to help a person have a better quality of life or have better restoration of health and dignity. And those social determinants of health, in, in a sense, have become sort of a buzzword or jargon, but but truthfully, that is health is created in the community, and it is created through good nutrition and through social support and dignity. Um, probably the person that I learned the most from, from was the former, uh, a former health commissioner and in, in, uh, director of, of health in San Francisco, Mitch Katz, Dr. Mitch Katz. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, Mitch, um, when he was responsible for the broad population of the city, got very involved in homeless housing and not just finding places for people to stay that were safe, but showers and yes. just the most essential components of human dignity. I, I've i learned, again, so much from my patients in that respect. And I'll just tell you one funny kind of poignant episode when I, I, for many years, would go back to San Francisco General and teach a couple weeks every year, even when I was in government or when I was uh, at Merck. And one time, someone from the San Francisco Chronicle heard that I was coming back. I think I was the CDC director at the time. So they decided to you know, see what I was up to, and they wanted to interview one of my patients. So the patient they chose to interview was someone who'd had an extremely difficult life and was in really, really bad shape when he came to the hospital. But when he found out that the newspaper was coming by and there was a photographer, he asked to get shaved, to get a haircut. Um, He got a clean t-shirt. I think it said San Francisco General Hospital on it. And his story got told. And it was the most amazing story, which I think really helped people realize that, again, it's a fine line between people who at one moment in time are having relatively successful lives. And in the next moment, through tragedy or mental health issues or just really bad luck can end up on the other side of the street or on the street, I guess, more accurately. And, you know, that that sense of th- the continuity of life as it flows from health to poor health to dreadful health and how difficult it is to move that upstream, that yeah. happens in the community. It doesn't really happen in the hospital. So that, you know, the community health center that you're involved with is just a beacon of hope for so many people. But it only happens because there are health workers who find it more important to be doling out the caring and the broader set of uh, of essential services than just the pills and, and, and the vaccines. I mean, it's been such an eye opener for me because... Um, it's all about whole person health. And you talked about dignity, and and I think that is so true. So um, as much as making sure that, you know, whether they keep supplies of people's medicines on site because of the instability of their living arrangements, or whether it's arranging for showers um, and, and even places to get clothes, you know, g- uh, get a haircut, get a shave, uh, or what have you, um, all of these things really impinge upon what is ultimately, you know, and, and I think of it as an old AIDS activist, you know, <laughs> access to HIV treatment, but it's so much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so after this, you join government. And and so here we here we are, we've had this this what seems to me a really incredible and um empath empathic sort of engagement with the patient community. Now, we often know you as the CDC director um, under George George W., George W. Bush. But in fact, you joined the CDC joined, uh, during the Clinton administration. And, and, and I guess after what you had done in San Francisco, why go to government? Why get into policy? <laughs> well, first of all, um, you know, I was probably naive about what going to the government actually meant. So there is a admission there. Um, but, you know, at the time in San Francisco, I had sort of started up a research unit that focused on nosocomial hospital-associated infections as well as occupational infectious diseases. And I was fortunate to have really good funding for the research part of that was responsible for the counseling and testing program. We found ways to support needle exchange in the community, et cetera, et cetera. But I I felt like I'd kind of been there my whole career and I needed to take a challenge Mm -hmm. to do something else. So when I had the opportunity to go to CDC and originally do much of the same in the part of the CDC that deals with those same problems, it just seemed like a natural progression. But I did it on a leave of absence from the university, fully intending to come back. 
So I didn't really cut the umbilical cord. I just thought of it as this is a chance for me to learn and grow and serve my country and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, make a contribution at scale in the process. And so it it was um, a little bit of naivete, a little bit of hope and a lot of learning, I would say. I I got to say I I think that is, this is if you don't mind my saying so funny because you know Jeffrey Copland steps down you become the director um <laughs> you know there you are on a leave of absence just you know <laughs> oh, your world must have been turned upside down now the thing is I got to know you at that point um as you were dealing with the anthrax attacks after 9/11 and you know, for people who who may not remember, a number of um, elected officials received um, envelopes, I guess, with anthrax in the post, and it became quite a quite a huge um, issue. It's perhaps lost a, a little bit of the uh, attention uh, over the years. But can you tell us what happened there? What the what the story actually was? Well, the story is long and probably not entirely understood even to this very day, but. You know, it, this started with 911 and the events on that tragic day in our history. So our mindset was suddenly propelled into a very different place where you know, we were attacked in the United States. I mean, that is mm. a very, very difficult thing for our Americans to understand and appreciate until it actually happens. And then just a month later, the anthrax um, attacks were detected by the death of a person in the, the very first envelope that was found. So it was hard not to relate those two events, terrorism attack mm -hmm. with airplanes, anthrax attack a month later. And then our minds became very focused on bioterrorism threats, radiation, terrorism threats, dirty bombs, etc. So um, during that period of time, the CDC was suddenly thrust into a very difficult situation because we were looking at the anthrax attacks as a public health emergency that needed investigation, medical intervention, and response. Meanwhile, the FBI was looking at it as a crime scene, and they wanted yeah. evidence and chain of custody and, you know, using their paradigm. So again, sort of this integration process occurred where the CDC and the FDA actually developed over a relatively short period of time a collaborative approach to investigation. And we embedded someone in Quantico and they embedded someone at the CDC and so on and so forth. So the process of coming to grips with the impact of the anthrax in the postal system, the fear and um, difficulties that so many postal workers experienced and everyone who received a white powder or found a white powder anywhere at that time was understandably frightened. It really forced the CDC to move from uh, a kind of conventional approach to infectious disease outbreaks to one that was playing out in real time on a national stage in the very Congress of our country, not to mention the entire postal system and beyond. And we were thrust into an environment of national intention. Um, we were overwhelmed with surge capacity, having to test all these powders. Yeah. We had to make um, what you would call, I guess, um, adaptive decisions without enough information to really know, was this powder anthrax or was this a false alarm? Um, all of the kind of hallmarks of agile crisis leadership were suddenly demanded of the CDC in an agency that actually had already instituted some important steps toward biopreparedness, but not at the scale necessary, and certainly not at uh, in a system that included our state and local counterparts. So it was an enormous learning curve. It was very frightening. I think in retrospect, I had PTSD for quite yeah. a long period of time after that, and it really did color my whole uh, anxiety about the next event or the next threat that we heard about. It was very hard to put new uh, outbreaks into perspective for a while because there was always that lurking fear. Was this intentional or was this mother nature? Yeah. And how do we make sure that we're prepared for both? So good well, training I, ground I, for risk communication and crisis leadership, I would well, say. Well, yes, totally, totally. But I, 
you know, and I think perhaps there are lessons for today in the way, I- I've got to say, the way that you communicated. So this affected me very personally because, um, uh, shameless plug for another of my podcasts, Business Fights AIDS, I was working for Ambassador Richard Holbrook at oh that time. And we made a visit to Senator Tom Daschle, who had unfortunately received one of these um, envelopes. Um, And we were required to go on a hurried course of Cipro, an antibiotic. Um, Mm. And uh, uh, in the uncertainty and the chaos of the moment, it sort of dawned on us that actually we had visited him before he received the envelope. (laughs) Um, But that didn't stop us from taking the Cipro. (laughs) You know, um, to this very day, when when I visit some of the places in Washington that were affected, I, 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 I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but sometimes I just wonder, could there be one little anthrax spore still left somewhere in this building that I should be worried about? And of course there aren't, and that's water under the bridge. But uh, you know, it was it was such a challenging time. I mean, anyone who's ever been in some of the congressional office buildings know how enormous they are and how much volume there is in the building. So no one knew how to remove spores from a space. Yeah. And it's the credit of a number of agencies um to really learn as they went and and solve for that and did a really excellent job. But in the crisis environment. It's hard to yeah. hard to go back in time and re- recall that part of it. I bet. I bet. Such a learning for what came next. And you've touched on, well, both the role of the deliberate human, but also the role of nature in driving new pandemics. You were the head of CDC and you oversaw its response to SARS um, and also Hurricane Katrina. And I wonder if you realized then that these were all sort of interrelated. Absolutely. And and, and the reason is before um, 911, when I was still in the hospital infections part of CDC, uh, Dr. Jim Hughes was the director of the National Center for Infectious Disease. And he and his colleagues um, were champions of the importance of emerging infectious diseases. And since the vast majority of new infectious diseases or re-emerging infectious diseases are animal in origin, that concept of the relationship between humans, animals, and and the environment in which they interact was something that was just kind of part of the infectious disease mantra. So that mental model was pretty well established before we were really experiencing such a (laughs) dramatic cascade of these events marching through. Um, but you know, it, it 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 it's not just the spillover from animals to humans that then initiates an outbreak or a pandemic in in our current environment. Even something like you mentioned, Katrina, um, there were infectious disease outbreaks that were a consequence of Katrina. People who were removing debris or belongings from brackish water who had skin wounds or liver conditions developed an infection called vibrio which um, can be really deadly in people who have weakened immune systems and so forth. So the environmental disaster had infectious disease consequences, just as infectious disease disasters have environmental consequences as well. So we're all in this together. And I, I do think that the coronavirus outbreak is, is really the exemplar of animal to human to animal and human. I mean, the chain of the spill over the back spill, the spill over the back spill is something that is, you know, kind of a experiment in progress. And I think it's going to change the way we approach the whole surveillance of infectious diseases going forward. At least I hope it changes the way yeah. we conduct surveillance. Yeah, I, 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 I think it, not, nothing will be the same in, in so many ways, but particularly in the way we think about how we manage how we manage infectious disease. And, and I guess that brings me to, to where you are now. And, um, you know, part of that change is a really a real strong commitment to public-private partnerships. And so after the CDC, you join Merck, you join the pharmaceutical industry. Um, Actually, around that time, I joined Johnson and Johnson, incidentally. So, <laughs> sort of quietly so you following. Yeah, 
And and one of the questions, I mean, that was my second time in industry, in fact, but but one of the questions I got then, I get it now, is well, what did you think you could do in the private sector that was not possible mm. as a civil servant? Or in my case, uh, as an as an activist and advocate. But in your case, what was it that you could do in the private sector that you couldn't do in government or couldn't do in academia? Well, for me, it was easy because I originally went to Merck to lead the vaccine business, which had experienced some challenges in manufacturing and was not really well poised to bring some important vaccines to the rest of the world. The, the products were mainly in the United States and Europe. So uh, when Mr. Clark, the CEO at that time, and Mr. Fraser, who became our CEO, um, asked me to consider the opportunity, and I think it was Ken, of course, who said, um, we need you to globalize Gardasil because the people who need it most are in the developing world, especially the people who also have HIV infection and who succumb to cervical cancer. And what good is it to get the antiviral drugs to protect people from the HIV if they die of HPV-related cancers in the meantime? And the, so, so the, the opportunity to, to, to bring a cancer prevention to the rest of the world is the scale, the you know, the impact, the the global health relevance of that was just such a powerful opportunity. And, you know, that was my personal objective when I went to Merck. And when I left the vaccine business after five years, we had globalized Gardasil. And yeah. we're not done yet. We still have lots more people to treat, but we got our manufacturing turned around and found ways to bring uh, that vaccine to people in an affordable way in in the corners of the world. So, you know, now that's you mentioned you mentioned <laughs> it Gardasil. really matters. Yeah. So so tell us a bit about what Gardasil is for for those that you know perhaps are not so familiar with the uh, HPV field. So HPV is a virus. Um, it infects um, cells in the genital system and other parts of the body, including the throat and, and pharynx, as a matter of fact. So when it sets up a chronic infection, certain strains of the HPV are capable of causing cancer. So it is basically a virus that has the potential to create cancer, cervical cancer, vaginal mm -hmm. cancer, anal cancer, oral pharyngeal cancer. And the vaccines that have been developed to combat HPV I've now been shown to reduce the risk of cancer. So we are living in a world where it would actually be possible, technically possible to eliminate HPV related cancers altogether. And, you know, that isn't something that we imagined 20 years ago, but it is something that is well within the range of possibility now. And there are countries that are well on the way. So uh, by vaccinating young boys and girls before they are ever exposed to HPV, uh, we can really almost entirely eliminate the risk of the related cancers. And the challenge of making this available globally and the added challenge of um, providing the vaccine, as you say, to, to young girls and boys before they have sort of reached the... Uh, the 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 age of um, let's say sexual awakening, Th those are all sorts of challenges. Uh, quite a quite a heady brew. So how did you approach that, um, and how did you reassure governments and I guess at the sort of the local level parents that this was the right thing to do? Well, the, the first of all, it's kind of a generic question because we have to face that with every vaccine. In fact, with every sort of population health intervention. But I think part of the challenge with the HPV cancer relationship is that most people don't know what HPV is, and they certainly right. didn't recognize that a viral infection could cause cancer over the long run. So there's a great deal of awareness and education that has to go on. Ironically, in my experience, it was actually easier to um, to work with that message in parts of the world that lived with HIV on a day-to-day -day basis. Right because people understood HIV virus, bad things happen later. And so it wasn't as far-fetched to think HPV virus, bad things happen later, i.e. cancer. 
And I, I think in some ways, the communities of people um, who lived in high prevalence HIV areas uh, were more receptive to HPV vaccination than others. So one big challenge is just kind of the the literacy around the relationship between this infection and, and the uh, chronic diseases that it can cause. I think the other part of it, though, is um, the understandable but confusing uh, aspect of HPV and sex. So, mm. you know, if you go in to get, I don't know what, your measles vaccine, the doctor does not feel compelled to have a conversation about sexual health. But when many clinicians are dealing with HPV vaccines, they do feel like the conversation about sexuality is part of that um, decision-making. And there are some clinicians who feel like, oh, you're 12 years old, it's time for your HPV shot, just as a matter of public health. Um, and there are others who you know, really feel that it's important to have a, a broader discussion. And that broad discussion some parents really welcome it and they find it helpful and, and children respond to that. Others are horrified to think yeah. about their child as being a sexual being way before they would hope they would be ready for that. And so it brings in a whole different dimension of adolescent medicine and adolescent health that um, creates controversy. And then that's kind of uh, complicated by some of the mythology around, um, you know, that if we vaccinate kids against HPV, it will encourage um, sexual behavior. And in fact, the data are very clear in the United States and several other countries that indeed that is absolutely not the case. But nevertheless, that mythology has had an impact on decision making as well. And, and mythology then you have to really into it, the the rest of the vaccine hesitancy, the more generic versions of that. So it it, it isn't easy, and I think you have to be culturally confident and yeah. you know work with um work work with the best understanding that you can acquire from the community in which you are you know you're working. Now you mentioned mythology, which I guess in a in a bizarre way, as it relates to vaccines, as it relates to treatments as it relates to whether disease exists or not at all, brings us to COVID. <laughs> and I guess, you, you, you know, Julie, when was it that you realized that COVID was the pandemic we were fearing and, and praying that we were actually prepared for, although we weren't? Well, um, we had SARS that emerged in the corner of China, probably in a wet market. Then we had MERS. And mind you, SARS only affected 8,000 people, but 10% of them died. Yeah. MERS has affected a lot of people and is continuing to stutter its way uh, as a zoonosis, probably spilling over bats to camels, camels to people. But it has an almost 50% mortality. So anyone who does not have their eye on coronaviruses as a threatening dimension of human health is probably not paying attention. So when you hear about a new coronavirus emerging in China, um, I, I think the default is to assume this is bad news until proven otherwise. And so, you know, I heard coronavirus and I was very nervous and apprehensive to see exactly how far this would go. And then when you began to understand what appeared to be, you know, very rapid community transmission and, and healthcare uh, infection, uh, it just seemed that the explosion was inevitable. I know that January I was at, in a meeting with Dr. Richard Hatchett from CEPI, mm. and Richard was probably the most vocal person in sounding the earliest alarm in the Western world about what this really meant. But he was not alone. I know um, several other infectious disease experts who had very similar points of view. And, you know, no one was listening at first. Yeah. It, took, it took some time for people to realize what was going on. There's a, there's a history to be written about um, I, I guess both the unique circumstances of the U.S. response, but also the broader public health response that we've we've had, and 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 I, and I guess you know not wanting to put you on the spot, 
But what, what do you think we could have done differently? How could we have persuaded people that this was something that that really we had to? It required a, a whole different order of response. You know, it's it's really challenging. Again, it goes back to sort of the basic principles of risk communication. Um, and the first kind of overarching issue is trust. Because if you trust the communicator, uh, you can forgive lack of information or even being wrong. But if the individual has credibility and integrity, um, you can c- continue to pay attention to that information and advice. But I think what happened, um, the politics got very complex and disruptive. The leading communication was not coming from the trusted people. It was coming from elsewhere in our government. But then there are also some aspects of even well-intentioned people who were trying to um, be helpful. Um, It kind of goes back to what I said earlier when I had to learn the hard way about how not to talk to scared people after an HIV needle stick exposure they're not really interested in charts and graphics. <laughs> they're really interested in recognizing that the people who are in charge actually care, that they recognize how hard this is and, and what the challenges are. And I think that a lot of that human dimension of the communication was really missing. Over-reassurance, over-promising, um, just a lot of you know, the do's and don'ts were mostly on the don't side of the equation at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, and and um, but there were there were bright lights in this. I mean, the yeah. the science in terms of vaccine, um, uh, if not the challenges around global access. Um, and Do you, then, of you know course, that by the end of 2020, there were more than 830 novel products in various stages of clinical development for vaccines, antivirals, diagnostics, et cetera. You know, science has been on our side from the beginning of this, but trust in science has been much harder right. to achieve. And that really is a tragedy, just a tragedy. That's, r- that's right. Um, and, and it has made me realize more than ever, that communications and the building of trust and working with the people that the leaders that people trust to provide them with information, that is as important in this new era as the scientific yeah. innovation itself. Um, and and that has been, I think, the horrific aha moment uh, for me in all of this. But but Merck um, has been working on therapeutics in um, in COVID, and I, I, I won't get into the, the details of that, but I'm more sort of interested in Merck's approach to global access more broadly, because um, it's something that, again, the company um, learned the hard way through the HIV response, but has really sort of emerged as one of uh, one of the leaders in in building these partnerships, and and I wondered if you could just perhaps say a little bit about what that means and and how that has come together. You know, I, I do feel a bias here because part of the reason why I was um, really happy to join Merck and the vaccines world is because Merck has a longstanding tradition of trying to do big things at scale, giving the full tech transfer to our hepatitis B vaccine to China, um, the river bindless program that has delivered billions of doses of a medicine to keep people from getting a, a infection in their eye that leads to bindless. These are parts of the DNA of the company. Uh, so, you know, I, I think with our Ebola vaccine, which is something we're obviously very proud of, um, you know, it's certainly not a profitable adventure and one that really, in some sense, set back some of our other programs because we had to make manufacturing space Mm. to pull the Ebola vaccine manufacturing through uh, a very challenging situation and circumstances there as well. But, you know, we did it because we could. It happens that we make a different vaccine in a similar cell line. So it wasn't a big stretch for us to understand how to possibly make an effective Ebola vaccine. And we have a pretty good one. But um, 
you know, with COVID, our vaccine, our early vaccine efforts were not as good as what others were able to do. And it didn't make sense for us to continue to pursue those particular candidates. Obviously, the work continues, but um, we are working with Johnson and Johnson and part of our decision to step up and try to make sure that their supply could be expanded and hopefully globalized was the recognition that we had some manufacturing capacity we could contribute in, and in a sense, it was the least we could do to try to be helpful in that space. Likewise, with our antiviral program, um, the drug that we, you know, our, our molnupiravir is the drug we have now, and it does have a, a value for non-hospitalized people. But when we, you know, knew that it could offer some hope and there was no hope in so many places right. in the world. It just seemed like, what can we do to get this available to people the fastest? And the simple answer to that was to license it to the generic manufacturers, whoever can make it should make it. And hopefully it can be useful and helpful to people. But that doesn't just come because a spirited leader, in this case, Rob Davis, you know, woke up one night and said, oh, here's an idea. Let's do this. It, it comes because we, um, we have a tradition and we have employees who believe that's the right thing to do. So I, I think that's part of the culture of an organization. And of course, there are other organizations that have a similar similar ethos. But for us, it's kind of, you know, it, it would be startling if we didn't it, it take steps like that in, in the context yeah. of a global pandemic. It, it would just not fit with how we see ourselves and what we believe in as a company. And I'm not trying to give a Merck advertisement here. I'm just saying that a lot of times people think that companies are only about profit. And what I say to people who have that notion is then, you know, you don't know the people who work in these companies and how incredibly passionate and dedicated they are to doing things that are truly helpful on a global basis. So going back to the question that I, I put to you about what is it that I think the private sector can do that the other sectors perhaps can't do, it's for me, it's the balance of the long-term vision with short-term flexibility and delivery. And I think with the principles of wanting um, you know, medications that save lives to reach as many people as possible, for the many, not the few. That I think is one of the great skills that that is brought, and I think there are, there are two things just to wrap this this part of the conversation up um, that I think you mentioned that are so key, and and one is um, you immediately referred to building generic partnerships and uh, licensing to generic companies, most likely Indian companies, where most of the expertise currently resides, although. You also mentioned China in relation to to Gardasil, the vaccine. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, that these conversations about access for you are happening at the same time as the medications and the vaccines are being developed. So it's not an afterthought. And I think those are two really key principles that that underpin a successful access strategy, which will be even more key uh, because, of course, COVID has taught us that. We're not safe until everyone is safe. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And I, I think the um, what you just said about the planning for globalization has to begin even before the definition of what the profile of the product we hope we will be able to make is fully worked out. I also think it's important um, to to make sure that we don't throw the apples and the oranges together in this bucket, because there are some medicines that are not going to be helpful in developed right. countries yet because they don't have health systems or they don't have x-ray machines or they don't have the kinds of durable um, medical systems and supplies that would allow them to be able to be used safely. So in those cases, part of what we do um, in the organization that I'm currently responsible for is to figure out how can we help build higher quality stronger health systems. For example, we have a venture investment, a sort of a social investment fund where we're investing in small companies that are trying to do that in the developing parts of the world to create a health system that's more able to benefit from the scientific advances that are available in more developed areas. So it's a long-term process, but the planning needs to start at the beginning, as yeah. you said, not as an afterthought. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, can I just add one more thing? Yeah. I think it's it's important here. We talk about access as 
is the product in the country. But access is also about uptake. And as you know, one of the big challenges we're having in the COVID um, pandemic is that even if we had vaccines and antivirals available, we still have to get them to people. And, you know, we have to get them at the community level, coming back full circle to our conversation so that um, they're trusted and utilized by the people who really need them. We're probably focusing a little too much on the supply since that's necessary, but it is not sufficient. And we do need to do more um, in terms of furthering the uptake of of the new medicines and vaccines when they do become available. Yes, it is hand in glove. It is, it's, absolutely the you know to borrow the phrase the other side of the coin the two yeah. absolutely fit together so so here we are at the end of march 2022 and you've got more news your journey is continuing and um uh, you know julie you've just it's just been announced that you're going to go to the foundation um for the national institutes of health as its new chief executive officer congratulations thank you i'm um, really excited <laughs> what is it going to entail well uh, you know the foundation exists to support the mission of the nih of course um most recently the fnih has been involved in coordinating active which is the public-private collaboration between the NIH and lots of industry members to prosecute the COVID vaccine trials, the diagnostics, and the antivirals that um, that collaboration has moved so successfully through the approval process in the United States. So that kind of middleware that the foundation provides is the specialized expertise that knows how to bring the private sector and the public sector together. It seems like, well, how hard can that be? Rent a room, bring the people in there, give them something good to eat. But actually the mechanism, the contracting, the intellectual property, the non-disclosures, the non-competitive collaboration, the complexities of being able to do this well are really highly specialized and highly um, honed skills at the FNIH. So um, one example is the COVID arena, but the FNIH has been doing um, these kinds of partnerships for more than 25 years. They also have a very big partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, the Gene Drive Project, which is one that's trying to um, prevent mosquitoes from being able to reproduce and transmit things like malaria. That's a project that the FNIH is responsible for. So there are many really exciting Frontiers of Science, the Biomarkers Consortium, the Neurodegenerative Disease Biomarkers um, Collaborative. These are areas where one company or one NIH institute can't really get the job done, but by coming together as a wise crowd, you can share resources, information, data, and hopefully accelerate and catalyze the whole process of translating uh, basic science into better tools for treatment. So that's that's all I know right now because I'm still in a very steep learning curve, but you can tell I'm pretty excited and I'm just so impressed with the work that's been done there. It's it's just amazing. Well, and and, and I hope you'll come back once you've got your feet under the table and and tell us what you're doing and and what's going on. But again, congratulations on this this new appointment. Now, we've come to the top of the hour and... um, uh, it's a question I ask all of our guests. Um, how have you kept safe and sane during the period of lockdown? I think we had a, a, an additional guest coming into um, your office. I think, was that a cat? <laughs> yes, so you heard. <laughs> yes. Well, we have dogs and, and, and I. Um, there have been occasions where our pug has uh, been sitting under the table and snoring incredibly <laughs> loudly. So I... I admit to admit to that but but how have you been staying sane during lockdown you know i've been busy for one thing because um you know we have about 75,000 employees at merck they're all over the world and they have been in harm's way at times um, we have had many people who have needed to be working because we have to keep our manufacture of other medicines mm. and vaccines going. Um, and we have people working in the research labs, et cetera. So 
we have to be open for business. And that means we had to really figure out how to do three things simultaneously. Number one, keep our employees safe and their families. Number two, maintain the supply of the essential medicines and vaccines. And number three, do what we could to contribute to the science. So for me, um, participating in Merck's internal emergency response was making my interior sense of purpose activated because this is something that I've actually had some experience with (laughs) for a long period of time in a lot of different kinds of outbreak situations. But also I care about our people. And yeah. Um, I I found it to be one way of feeling contributory and at the same time, you know, protecting my safety as well as the safety of those around me. One of the most rewarding dimensions of that for me was visiting our manufacturing sites in all corners of the United States, um, just to be able to sit down quietly with people who were bombarded with all kinds of misinformation and confusing information and just really listen and understand what can we do to help them make good decisions about vaccination and and other aspects. So I guess for me, um, sublimation is the technical term. I I manage my own anxiety by putting my energy into trying to create a safer and, uh, you know, survival at Merck. But on the other hand, Ironically, this is probably the healthiest I've been in a long time because I'm not <laughs> traveling. I have a normal diet. I am home with my husband. Um, we are lucky enough to live on a few acres of land in the woods, so we have a very peaceful and lovely place. And you know, I've tried to to reflect a little bit on how fortunate I am to be mm. grateful and graceful about um, the fact that we haven't been tragically affect, affected or afflicted like many of our friends and people we care about. So counting my blessings is another yeah. coping strategy. Well, I, you know, Julie, thank you so much for sharing an incredible life with us from small town roots to global reach. Both the science and indeed, I think your humanity really shine through. So thank you for everything that, that you do. You truly are a shot in the arm. <laughs> that's, that's, I love it. And thank you, Ben. I, this has been a, a powerful, reflective conversation for me. I'm not used to looking at my life in, 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 in the retrospective scope, but I think you've also helped me recognize that I'm not done yet and I still have a lot of work to do and things I care about. So thank you for the opportunity to, to come back in touch with that. And thank you for what you do to bring these stories forward. It's important that we maintain that communication and connection. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you to Julie Gerberding and good luck, Julie, at the Foundation for the NIH. Thanks also to Sarah Anderson and her colleagues at the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. Thanks to Erica Sparer of Newsdoc Media, our director. A Shot in the Arm podcast is a member of the Health Podcast Network and it's a project of the Icana Health Action Lab. And finally... Thank you to you. Have a great week and a safe week, everyone.